I'm Tony mm. Ruiz with Gold Derby here with Ryan O'Connell, the writer, star, uh, creator of Special, which has just aired its second and final season on Netflix. And and Ryan, you know, the series started as a short as a short series, and is now in its uh, in this season is expanded to full episodes. Uh, what was the biggest challenge, or was there a challenge in the show moving to that format? There was literally no challenge. The challenge was making it short form. That was the challenge. That was like me trying to squeeze a half hour show into 15 minutes and always feeling creatively blue balled. So like the idea of being able to luxuriate in 30 minutes, I felt like I was truly on vacay. Like I was obsessed. And um, it was a really seamless transition. I mean, I knew that in building out the half hour, I wanted to have a story for Kim. And that's that was the real huge impetus for going to half an hour was that I really hated that Kim had been kind of relegated to this like sassy sidekick that's like, you go, Ryan, go fuck that guy. You know, I felt like there was a lot more there. <laughs> um, so in season two, it was an absolute delight to be able to expand it and go deep into her character. Uh, so in, 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 in doing this, you know, you really had a, a writer's room really for the first time. Um, yeah. And, and, and so, so what was that experience like? Well, I hired all gay men and women, which is like my version of heroin. Um, so I just like was, and three out of the six of the writers identified as disabled. So that was like iconic and amazing. Um, so I, I loved it. I mean, I'm a collaborative bitch. You know, I've been writing for TV till, since 2013. So a writer's room is really natural for me. It's how I usually break stories. I, what's not normal is breaking an entire season of TV in a cafe on Beverly Boulevard. So like, this was an absolute highlight. And I feel like everyone in the writer's room just brought such a great perspective. And I think they widened the show. So it didn't feel so myopic. And um, it was it was a dream. It was also just a dream to like, be able to cultivate a really happy atmosphere for work. You know, I think I've been, you know, I've experienced writer's rooms that are not like that completely. And it was nice to kind of actively, you know, make work a really exciting place to be. <laughs> Was this sort of the first time that you were in that kind of like, I'm the boss position? I mean, yeah, I've always been a bossy bitch, but like never officially. I mean, I mean, season one, I was like, it felt like I was the boss, I guess. I was the de facto showrunner, the sole writer of all the episodes. So in terms of like the decision making, a lot of that fell on me. Um, and so, but this was the first time that I actually had to like, you know, manage a staff and delegate responsibility and all this stuff. But I really loved it. I mean, I think the biggest job of a showrunner is two things. Number one, having a vision for the show. And I better have one for that. <laughs> special. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't, we have bigger problems, you know, to fry. Uh, and then second of all is being decisive, you know, making a decision, committing to it and moving on. Because, like, you know, you're running against a time clock. And so just being able to be assertive and authoritative and be like, this is where we're going, this is the direction we're going, the, sh the ship has sailed, is um, a big part of the job. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. And again, I really enjoyed being a nice boss, not like a Meryl Streep Devil Wears Prada boss. <laughs> I love that that's where you go immediately. I mean, isn't that just the kind of the de facto for all of us to go to that one? Yeah, of course. And as you know, Meryl Streep Devil Wears Prada plays a figure in season two. Yeah, she does. Um, so it, from an acting perspective, you know, this, this season really, you kind of really wrote a lot for yourself to do in terms of really putting you in these really vulnerable situations in terms of Ryan, not just navigating his relationship with his mother, but also, you know, this complex kind of, you know, open relationship, not open relationship. You know, there's a lot of sexual issues that are I think we're seeing in a whole new way. So were, were you scared of any of the stuff that you were putting yourself through? Well, when I'm writing it, I feel like I have to completely divorce myself. Like I, like I, like in the writer's room, it was brought to my attention many times. Like, you know, Ryan, you're going to have to do this. And I'd be like, bah, 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 just swat it away. I think if I actually thought about the things that I would have to do, it would really paralyze me. And like, <laughs> I think the season would suffer. So I think it's like compartmentalizing, which I'm very good at. Like my brain is like the container store where we write. And I just kind of like, 
I do what the story needs to do. And then I worry about what Ryan, the actor does later. You know what I mean? And like, yes, there were, I remember the first week of shooting block one, I was basically like in a cock sock the entire week. And I was like, I don't love this, but then I had no one to blame but myself. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You know what I mean? I, of, of the aspects of, of this season, um, you know, the relationships and, the, and, and, and Ryan in many ways, uh, the character coming to really kind of, you know, not just accept his disability, but try to be in an atmosphere and surround himself with people who celebrate that yeah. and not see it as like, and this other thing. Um, was, that, was that really a, an important thing for you to focus on? Yeah, it was super important. I mean, I think season one, Ryan's living in a fishbowl and he has a lot of internal noise stabilism, which we kind of explore in season one when he gets set up with uh, a deaf guy and is disgusted. Um, and I think season two with the character development, it would make total sense that he would want to reach out and kind of form a disabled tribe. So that was something I was really, really excited to do. Just also like being on set with like primarily disabled actors. Like when we shot Crip Prom, I looked around the room and I was like, wow, I'm in the majority for once. That has literally never happened in my life. I have not, I can't even count how many times I've been in a room where it's been like one other disabled person. Like that's, that's rare in itself, let alone a set where it's primarily disabled people. It was, it was amazing. And it was also really sad that it took 34 years and creating my own Netflix show in order for it to happen. <laughs> but you know, they say you build it and they'll come. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you've done it, what has been the response that you've received? Uh, because it, again, it is a sad statement to say that, that we really don't get to see this on television unless it's, you know, like a very special episode of something or, right. or, it's a, or it's a documentary. We've never seen it really in this kind of, in a comedy format, much less a narrative format. So, so what has been the response that you've received from it? It's been incredible. I mean, the disabled community has always been really DTF with special, which I'm so fucking grateful for because whenever you're one of the first people to tell a story about a large population of people that's been criminally underrepresented, you get scared. You know what I mean? Because you know, as a storyteller, you can't speak for everyone's experience. That's impossible. You know what I mean? The, well, the people that try to speak for everyone's experience is like a CBS multicam. And then it ends up, you know, appealing to nobody because it's gibbity gobbity goo garbage. Um, so I knew that I needed to be specific and through that specificity, there would be universality because the common threads of human existence are really powerful, blah, 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 the point of storytelling, blah, blah, blah. Right. But um, seeing everyone really respond to it and feel seen and heard, even if my disability doesn't look like theirs, even if my story doesn't really look like theirs, um, it's really, really been incredible. And I, I think like there's been some reviews that I've read that really understand what I'm trying to do, which is so good. That's like, you know, special is a show about something. It is, it's about disability. It's about queerness. It's, um, you know, about being a curvy brown woman trying to fit into this capitalist hellhole society. It's about a lot of meaty things, but I never want it to feel that way. I never want you to feel, I never want it to feel didactic. I never want it to feel like I'm finger wagging and telling you what the story is about and what lesson you should learn. It's called special. It's not called after school special. And um, that's like, <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's so important to me. Like my rule of thumb with writing is always cover those vegetables in sugar. Like you don't know that you're eating kale and getting your daily nutrients because I just covered that shit in like a mountain full of chocolate and sprinkles and whipped cream. So you're gonna be like, yum, 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 yum. And then your brain's gonna be like, I think I learned something, cool. Like that's my whole intention and that's my whole vibe. And to me, one of the most, you know, I think the most, the, the realest relationship, the one that I particularly identify with is the relationship between Ryan and his mother, uh, played by, you know, the magnificent Jessica Hecht, who, uh, what has been that relationship like? Because you two are so believable as parent and child, complete with dysfunction. Yeah. Um, um, what is that working relationship like? Well, we're close in real life. I mean, I think that's like a lot of actors say that shit, but it's like, lol, well, we actually are. <laughs> um, and also I think a lot of actors say, I know everyone says we're really close, but really we are. And you're like still not believing it. But no, <laughs> Jessica, Jessica is 
a kooky woman. Like she beats to her own drum. She's mischievous. She's playful as fuck. She's just an oddball. And like, I love her energy. And I think she infuses a lot of herself into Karen and made it her own. And like, our relationship does feel like mother-son vibes. Like she does things that like annoys me and I'm like, Jessica, like stop. And she like gets a kick out of it. I feel like it's like very blurred lines where she'll like harass me and poke at me. And I'm just like, leave me alone. So it feels like life imitating art a little bit. And I just, I'm obsessed with her. And I feel so grateful to have like a real friendship with her. And because, you know, I mean, I think everything you do with them is like a trust fall. And Jessica really trusted me. She trusted my writing. She trusted me as an actor, which I felt like very embarrassed by by season one. I was like, LOL, I'm a first time actor. I don't really know what I'm doing. And I'm acting alongside Jessica Hecht. Like this is insane. And I feel bad for her in advance. I'm going to send flowers. Um, But Jessica never made me feel inadequate. She always was so supportive as a scene partner. Like what, like my, whenever I had to shoot with her, I was like, oh, this is going to be a fucking dream because she just gives you so much as a performer. And it's just like an embarrassment of riches. So I really love her. And I feel like what you see on screen, why it feels so connected and why the chemistry is like fire is like, it sort of is like our real relationship a little bit. It's interesting that you talk about, you know, feeling insecure as an actor, uh, particularly in season one, did that change at all in season two? Did you feel more confident in this season? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just always better when you've done something before and you're not, like, you're not scared of it. Like when I did season one, again, I had never acted before in my life. So like, I, I trusted my director, Anna DeCosa, that we were getting what we needed. And like, I, I felt good about certain things. And I kind of like, there were moments where I felt very clued into my performance and I was really happy with it. But there were also times where I was like, I don't know how to do that. Um, So it was sort of stressful. Um, Season two, I just, yeah. I mean, I I kind of, I'd done it. So I felt more connected to this character. I I felt more connected to his physicality, his way of being. And um, yeah, I definitely felt a little more confident and I hope it shows in the performance. I, I hope people like it, so. We'll see. Uh, it, it, we we ha- of course have to you know talk a little bit more about Poonam Patel who yes. um, who really gets you give her this this wonderful arc um, and it's it I was telling her when I spoke to her that it it's almost a completely in on some levels it is the typical gay guy straight girl relationship but it's it's yet so fresh and so different. What is it about the connection between you and her and between Ryan and Kim that just works so well? I mean, honestly, it's sort of like Jessica Hecht vibes. It's like, I met Poonam and we just got along like a house on fire. Like we never saw anyone else for Kim. Like I met Poonam and I was like, this is it. Like we don't even need to like go for a casting call for this person because I just loved her so much. I loved her. Like she also had a mischievous spirit that like is infused with warmth. Like it's like kind of similar vibes. They're very funny, very playful, but there's just an inherent warmth that you really don't get with everybody because sometimes people aren't that warm in real life oops and they can't fake <laughs> it um but Poonam and Jessica are like legit gen sweetie lollers and I think it shows and with Poonam and I like we even though we had just met before shooting like we'd only hung out I think like twice before we shot there was just we just understood each other like I mean I don't know and like we just really feed off each other's energy like Poonam's also a very gifted improviser so like a lot of the jokes you see from Kim are from her on set, just riffing. And I love an improv set. I really do. And I'm so, I, I feel so spoiled because I feel like I hired like truly gifted improvisers and like natural writers, um, which isn't always the case, you know? And so um, I think what you're seeing between me and Puna, again, it's sort of real. Like we just loll our fucking faces off and have so much fun. And like shooting together, we're like constantly laughing and fucking up takes, which is like really hard because we don't have a lot of money and we need to keep the train moving. So they're like, there are times where we've been like legit reprimanded being like, you guys need to get your shit together because we need to shoot this scene. And we're just like on the floor laughing our asses off. And I think that enthusiasm and that real connection shows in the show. I think it helps everything. 
I just love that the the the, 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 produ- the creator and the writer and the star of the show can still get reprimanded. That's, that's oh, crazy. I'm always fucking up takes. I because I I laugh so much. Like when Lauren Weeman's on set, fucking forget about it. That funeral episode, like everything she did, you couldn't get coverage of me. Like I, there's one scene in particular that I'm so embarrassed by because like they had to shoot around me. Like I remember one, like they just. Like Lauren was taught not to do anything so I could get through a take. I know I, I felt so bad. I was like, cause it was my coverage. And they're like, Lauren, just please like, just don't even be funny. Like we just need Ryan to not break into hysterics. And uh, yeah, as you can tell, I'm a very professional actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, before my last question, I just have to ask one thing that, has, that makes me giggle every time I think, who came up with the concept of Adderall spritzers? Oh, me. <laughs> why (laughs) i mean i'm always look we have to talk all day long it's so boring you need to i just need to always remix words to make them interesting again um and adderall spritz it was right there hello adderall adderall you have to also understand that i wrote for a season of will and grace so my brain is ruined forever for puns but i will say also i was already kind of ruined because my girls just want to have puns i mean like i'm just I'm broken. It's a disease. It's my other disability. It's punning. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just, they come to me no matter what. I, I, I'm i writing for the Queer as Folk reboot. And I, and like even today in the writer's room, like we were talking and I just had to do like three puns. And like the room just knows now that I need to release them like an exorcism and they just accept it. <laughs> so the, the, the series kind of, ends with with Ryan in this kind of really kind of hopeful place there's a certain level of ambiguity but yet there's also a certain level of 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 hope that have was that always kind of the intention did you always know how you wanted the show to end I did I mean I don't think I had like a I, I don't think it was set in stone I think we found a lot of things as we went along but like things did evolve through the breaking of the season for example when we introduced the character of Henry, like we initially wanted to play that as a real love triangle between Tanner, Henry and Ryan. And then honestly, TBH, that just felt like too much like straight culture. Like to me, what felt authentic to gay life was like, you meet someone, you have a crush on them sort of, you like think they're cool, you kiss, you go on a few dates and then you're like, "Mm, I think we're better off as friends. And like, and it's like, that's just, that's just gay life to me. Like when, when Henry says, I think we're both bottoms, like that's a joke, but also like not. Like, <laughs> like I think like, I, I've seen some responses of like, being like I wish Ryan and Henry ended up together. And I understand it because like, I understand rooting for that relationship because they're, they're very similar and it's a, it's a good thing to ship. But I just feel like it's not authentic to queer culture. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I just wanted to like, I just wanted to subvert that kind of like heteronormative trope a little bit. So, so with this experience, you know, this experience really has, I think, you know, kind of put you on the map in many, many ways. Um, um, so what's next? What map? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what, 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 what's next? Is there going to, I mean, obviously you just said, you know, more writing obviously is, is more acting in your future. Yeah. I'm definitely planning on acting more, you know, being on special has spoiled me because I've had such control over the character and the writing. And like, I do get occasionally sent audition slides and stuff and I just don't do them because they're not good. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, why would I do something that's like not good? Like, why would I play like gay guy number four that's like giving some girl advice over like a latte and like being like, you should be with him. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's not my journey. Like I've already played a complicated gay character. So like it needs to make sense strategically like what I want to do next. It needs to like be a great experience. So I do plan on acting again. I mean, we're we're turning my novel into a movie. I'm just getting ready to write the screenplay and then hopefully we're shooting that next year and I will be starring in that. So that'll be great. Um, and yeah, there's other stuff that uh, I can't talk about yet, but yeah, there, there's stuff happening, but um, I still have some control over <laughs> <laughs> you know. well um i i just think that special has been and i'm not even gonna you know do the double meaning of the word but it just has really been an important show and um i i really really appreciate uh 
the contribution uh, to the story that you've told. Uh, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, and stay tuned with interviews uh, for, with more contenders throughout the season. Ryan O'Connell, uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.